Senora. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. Isn't it amazing what we have freedom of being able to be here and enjoy everyone's company, whether you like them or not, but you can smile and say hello. It's so great. And, uh, and so we want to welcome all of you. And one of the things that we have, it's a powerful time at 9.30 every Sunday morning. If you want to join, come in for prayer. We pray from 9.30 until 10. And that is really a great, great time. Because you can share what you need to be prayed for or to share. It's always wonderful. And then the ladies. I know we love to go shopping, right? Oh, yeah. well, of course. <laughs> so this Tuesday, the 28th, we're going to meet here at the church at 2 o'clock. We will be carpooling. And we're going to go antiquing in Port Angeles. There is a, a place, um, where's Gloria? Gloria, do you know the name of the place that we're going to? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she knows where it's at, so that's a good thing. So it'll be a fun time of fellowship with the ladies and, and get to look at all kinds of goodies. And then we will have, oh, the Women's Ministry, which has been meeting on Saturday once a month. We're going to be, we've had to move it to Saturday, July the 9th at 3.30. We meet here at the church. And it's a time of really getting to know one another, a time of sharing and fellowship. So we encourage all of you ladies, if you want to get away from the kids, get away from the husband, this is the time to do it. And then, uh, we, and then we have, of course, midweek Bible study. Yeah. And that is a great time. This last Wednesday was awesome. Yeah. It, it, it really yeah. was. For yeah. so just the little ones that were here, it was a time of relaxing, refreshing, and I think we were really ju juvenile. It was truly a good time. And that's at 5.30 on Wednesdays. And then we're having the Gateway Youth Car Wash. And that's going to be on July the 9th from 9 a.m. to 12. It'll be right here in the parking lot. And brochures are being handed out. So this is a fundraiser. So empty your pockets out. They're all going to a good cause. They're all going to a good cause. It's for the, the uh, ministry for the youth. And it's, and it's a neat thing too, you have fun, and it's gonna be hot, you can uh, sprinkle water on you <laughs> in the midst of clean cars. So again, and as the flowers were passed out, and then, um, Tithe and offerings. We have uh, in the back, there is a box that you can drop off your offering, or you can go on to gatewaychurch.org and uh, do it online. So with all that, we are really in for a treat today. We're having a dual sermon. It's a father and a daughter. I think that's great. And so with that, we have Pastor Dana and his lovely daughter. Yeah. Very excited today. Our daughter Mary is visiting from Redding, California with her awesome husband, Robert, and three of our grandbabies. Yeah. And so, yeah, me and Mary, we've been involved in things together over the years. Went on a mission trip together. We've done a lot together. We've never preached together like this. Praise God. Yeah. May this be the first of many such occasions. Yes, yes. So, so Mary's going to start us out, and then she's going to do this uh, smooth handoff to me, and then I'll keep rolling, and then we're going to close out. All right. All right. Yeah. So, thank you, son. Welcome, Mary. All right. Amen. <laughs> He said, my name is Mary, and I've noticed a couple of you kind of side-eyeing me, trying to figure out which one I look like. Um, <laughs> I am their 
their spiritual daughter. Um, and so I met them when I was 18 and I was on drugs and alcoholic, coming from a really broken home, um, suicidal and hating everybody. Mm -hmm. And I can't stand here today and share anything with you until I honor my mom and dad. Yeah. I would not be here, literally, if it wasn't for Dana and Cheryl and for the way that they love me and they pursued me. Um, I had heard about God off and on growing up, but he was angry and distant. And when I met them, I had no idea why they liked me or they stuck around me. Um, I was very confused, but I knew that I felt God. And I have to tell you, watching them over the past 18 years, they create family like I have never yes. seen. Yes. So for those of you that want more family, that want to build family, like your spiritual mom and dad over here, yeah. I just want you to take a second and close your eyes. And I want you to posture your heart to honor them. Whether they're younger or older than you, or they talk different than you. Just a little sideways joke. Um, just posture your heart to honor them. Just say, Jesus, I honor them. Mm -hmm. I honor the way they build family. I honor the way they build kingdom. Because the cool thing in the kingdom is, if you want something, honor somebody that has it and you'll catch yeah. it. Amen. Yeah. Amen. More yeah. is caught than is taught. It's like they're running around with a can of spray paint and you just get to bask in the mist yeah. and you get the anointing and you get the gifting when you honor. And so I honor you, and I thank you for letting me do this. I'm going to try not to cry the whole time. So, <sighs> okay. Um, so I know Dana likes to do um, PowerPoints and whatnot. I'm not that technically gifted, and I want to cover a lot of ground today. So um, I'm going to try to paraphrase a bunch of stuff. So strap your seatbelt in. And... Take, we're going to take another second and say heart. 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 It's okay. It's okay. Good. It's going to, we're moving a little quick and it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Jesus. As I was praying for you guys, um, something that I, I wanted to share is you are the object of his affection. This morning, um, just standing here, you are family. Even though I don't get to come and visit you, we're family in the kingdom, but you're family because of them as well. Yeah. Um, and I really feel like Jesus wants you to know you are the object of his affection. And so I'd like to take a second. I'm going to have you do a couple things. We're going to say, Jesus, 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 I am the object of your affection. I am the object of your affection. I receive your love today. I receive your love today. I am the object of your affection. I am the object of your affection. Amen. Okay, give me just a second here. Being old school, I've got notes upon notes upon notes. There you go. So. All right, so what I want to talk to you about today is called um, Partnering with God, and I'm going to take a look at this with you through the Old Testament. Um, so the first thing that I want, to, I want to tell you about, I'll tell you where we're heading because it's going to, like I said, there's a lot here. Um, so Partnering with God, I'm going to talk to you about the how. How do we partner with God? And then Dana is going to talk to you about who we partner with. So... First of all, there's a couple things. I'd say the three main points are, number one, how we partner with God is we uphold him as holy. We believe he is who he says he is, and he's going to do what he says he's going to do. Okay? Number two is, um, in the midst of your pain and your heartache or in a tough season, don't mistake God's silence for apathy or detachment. He is literally walking through your life, planning deliverance, whether he tells you that or not. 
He is always there and he is always up to something and he is always speaking. And then the other main point would be um, repentance. I know that's like everybody's favorite word, right? Yeah. Um, so we're going to take a look at this. Um, Saul, he kind of messed up a little bit and he didn't own it. And then David messed up perhaps as equally bad, maybe even a skosh more. Um, but he owned it. He said, I have sinned against the Lord, and he owned it. And it didn't change God's opinion of him. It didn't change how God loved him, and it didn't change the plans that God had for his life because he came into God's face and said, I have sinned against you. Okay? So keep those in mind. Um, the first scripture that I want to look at, we're going to start with Moses. So, in Numbers 20, verses 6 through 13, I'm going to give you the references. I would ask that you don't try to read all of it because it's going to be a lot of scripture, and I want you to just connect with Jesus while I speak. Um, so we have Moses leading the Israelites out, of the, out in the wilderness, right? And back in Exodus 17, God tells him to strike the rock and bring water out of the rock for all of the people and all of their animals. Now, the Israelites were complaining because they're in a desert and it's hot and they're thinking about Egypt and how great it was, even though they don't have the best memory of how Egypt really was. They're thinking, oh, the good old days, yeah. right? <laughs> they weren't very good. Right. But they may have been a little better than what they're experiencing at the time, so they were complaining and they, they're giving Moses and Aaron a hard time. So Moses and Aaron are just you can tell they're frustrated when you yeah. read this passage. So they go and they seek Jesus. They seek God. They fall on their face and they are like, God, what should we do? And God is like, you will speak to the rock and the rock will pour out its water and all the people and all their livestock will have their drink. Right. And so they Moses gets this word from God and he's going to go out and he's going to speak to the rock. He goes out there and they're quarreling. This is at the waters of Meribah, which literally means quarreling. So they're out there quarreling, arguing, pressing all of Moses' buttons, I imagine. And instead of speaking to the rock, Moses goes out and he says, You rebels, shall we bring water out of this rock for you? And he strikes the rock twice. So this comes to my first point. Upholding God is holy. If we look... Um, let me get the right address here. If we look at what God says to Moses here, he says, you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. This is where Moses learns that he's not going into the promised land. And it was because he didn't uphold God as holy in the sight of Israel. God gave him a word. He could choose to partner with it or not. And in that moment, he gave in to the people, he gave in to frustration, yeah. and he blew it. Yeah. So then we fast forward to Deuteronomy 34, and we have the death of Moses. Yeah. Something really cool here that you might miss if you don't know God's character or the ancient Near Eastern culture. God takes Moses, and he goes up Mount Nebo, and God gives him a vision of all the tribal lands yeah. that the tribes are going to inherit. So he's up on this mountain, and you guys, I'm sure you've been on the mountains around here. On a good, clear day, you can see about 10, 15, oh, yeah. 20 yeah. miles, maybe, when it's really clear. So the ancient Near Eastern people, he gives all of the, the different places, all of the tribal lands, all these geographical landmarks, and they would have known there's no way that Moses could have seen all of this land. It was over, it was over 100 miles. But it was also in the future. God caught him up in a vision and said, Moses, this is what you've been working for. You've been leading these people in the desert, and this is where they're going. This is the promise that I gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and this is what they will inherit. So they, it's dripping with grace. In that moment, he is literally saying, you know, yeah, you blew it, and you're not going to be able to lead them there, but this is where they're going. And I am a covenantal God, and my plans will not be stopped. Yeah. 
when you mess up. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Beautiful, beautiful yes. picture. Yes. The next scripture that I want to look at is um, the call of Gideon. So it would be in Judges 6, verses 11 through 24. Um, all of my landmarks are wrong. There you go. Okay. So um, in this, Israel has this pattern of worshiping foreign gods. Um, all throughout their time with God, God basically comes and he says, this is who I am. This is how you're going to live with me. And Israel will go for a while, and they will listen, and they will follow, and they will obey. But the culture back then, everybody worshipped foreign gods. Like, they were just inundated with it. Yeah. And so they thought the sun was a god, the land was a god, the seas and the storms were a god. And so everywhere they go, everyone is worshipping foreign gods. And then Yahweh comes along, and he says, no, I am the only god, yeah. and you will worship me. So they go through these ups and downs, right? You read through the Old Testament and you see that. So Israel has kind of wandered away from God at this moment. And lo and behold, the Midianites come. So they're in a new land and the Midianites destroy Israel. Literally like the second they grow anything, the Midianites come and they devour it. They are devouring their land like a swarm of locusts. You can't even count them. So in this moment, we find Gideon, and he is threshing wheat in a wine press. If you don't know, threshing wheat was like a community event, and it happened in a big open field, and you had to have a lot of help. And it required oxen to pull around this big, huge wheel to crush it to be able to process this grain. And Gideon is hiding in a wine press, which is partly underground, doing the work of probably 10 or more people by himself to hide it from the Midianites. Wow. This is not good. Mm. And then, so all of Israel at this time thinks that Yahweh, God, has just completely forgotten them. He doesn't know them. He doesn't know about their plight. Everything is wrong, and he's gone. Mm. But this comes to my second point, which is God is walking through the land of your hardship, planning deliverance before you even know it. Yes. So at this point, Israel cries out, and they're like, God, oh, we messed up. God, help us. God, help us. So do you know what he does? He sends a prophet, and the prophet basically says, you know, God told you do not fear and do not worship these other gods, and you didn't listen. That's it. That's all the prophet says. He says you didn't listen. So how do you think Israel felt at that moment? They're like, what the crap, <laughs> right? But in the very next sentence, we pick it up, and it's in verse 11. Now the angel of the, of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, the tree, at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the Abizurites, while his son Gideon was beating out the wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. So the angel of the Lord literally is walking through the land, and he sits down, and he watches Gideon. And the first thing he says to him is, my man. There you go. Right? Mm -hmm. This guy is hiding. He's hiding what he's doing, <laughs> and he's afraid. That's right. And the angel of the Lord calls him a mighty man. There you go. Some, some places say he can play like mighty man of valor, yeah. mighty yeah. warrior. Mm -hmm. Ain't that just like God? <laughs> he sees us. Yes. to our fullest potential. He calls us and looks at our lives to our fullest potential. It's actually called a proleptic word. It's a proleptic, prophetic word where you call something that is not as though it is. So in this moment, the angel of the Lord comes and he says, my man, go deliver Israel. And Gideon's like, um... Yeah. He says, my Lord. Now, what you need to realize here is he's not saying, my Lord God. He is being nice, and he's honoring this person. He doesn't know it's the angel of the Lord yet. Right. And he's like, oh, my Lord, person of honor. Like, if God really was with us, the God of Israel that brought us out of Egypt, yeah. this wouldn't be happening. This wouldn't be happening. And, um, and God is like, go in your might. Am I not sending you to save Israel? Yeah. 
And Gideon tells him again, he's like, I'm the least, we are the least in the tribes, and I am the least in my family. Like, basically, God, you, like, you don't know who you're talking to. Like, I can't do this. And the Lord just says, go in your might. Huh. Mm -hmm. So what was Gideon's might? Have you thought about it? So you literally just got to telling God, I have no might. And God's like, aha, your might is me. Yeah. Yeah. I go with you. Yeah. That's all the might you need. And if you know the rest of the story, he does go on to defeat yeah. all of the surrounding armies. And I think he's a judge over Israel for 40 years. Something like that. My timing may be off. But so go in your might. Yeah. Be humble enough to realize that you have none. That he is your might. My next um, two scriptures that I kind of want to compare very quickly is um, 1 Samuel. So we see Saul here. He gets anointed king. And um, the first thing that he does is he's going to go out and face an enemy army. And um, Samuel, the prophet, was like, you know, in seven days I'll meet you at Gilgal. I'll do the sacrifice and we'll find out what the Lord has for you to do. Saul goes out and he's with his men and they're going to go into battle and he starts freaking out. The guys are freaking out. So Saul's like, this is not going to end well. Where is Samuel? Samuel's not there yet. He doesn't show up yet. So he knows what he's supposed to do. He has a word from the prophet of the Lord on what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to wait. But he's looking at everybody around him and he's like, oh no, I can't wait. Like I need to offer this sacrifice. So he goes and offers the sacrifice, and here comes Samuel. Samuel's like, what did you do? <laughs> because he was the king. He wasn't the priest. That, at that time, was not his job. He was not supposed to do that. So it was like the first thing that God said to him, Saul just uh, forgets it, goes and does what he thinks is best. He literally tries to be God in this moment and says, I know what's best in this situation. And in ancient Near Eastern culture, they would have all, like, the people knew everything, thought they knew everything was a god. They would offer sacrifice to try to trap a god, little g god, and manipulate it. So Saul's getting into this way of thinking that's all the way around him, and he's like, I'm going to get the favor of the Lord by offering this sacrifice. And he was wrong. This is the beginning of his downfall. But he doesn't own it. He's just like, oh, I broke a rule. I'm sorry. That's it. And then we go to 1 Samuel 15, and this time Saul is supposed to go out against the Amalekites, I believe it is, um, and he's supposed to get rid of them. Like, they are doing detestable things. They're offering their kids in sacrifice. They are as wicked as they come, and God wants to use Saul and his army to wipe them out because they, they just can't eat. They're steeped in so much sin, it has to stop. And he says, you will destroy everything. Saul doesn't do that. He he gets their king Agag, and he's like, oh, I'm going to take him, and look at how mighty I am. And then his men are like, well, these cows and these sheep look really nice, and, you know, like all some of their gold and stuff, we could yeah. take that, and maybe we'll give it to the Lord. Maybe we'll sacrifice it. Yeah, we'll sacrifice it. That'll be good. So okay. they come up with this plan, and they take the king, and they take a bunch of the best things, That's right. and here comes Samuel. Samuel's like, what did you do? And Saul's like, I did exactly what the Lord told me to do. I obeyed his voice, and we have the king here, and I've got all these things to sacrifice. This is awesome. Bless you. And Samuel's like, uh, no, I think you missed it. Yeah. Let me find it. Are you guys doing okay? We're good. Yeah. Okay. Um. Samuel. So Samuel says to Saul, you've done foolishly. You have not kept the command of your Lord with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people. In this moment, he loses his kingdom. Yeah. Because he thought he knew better than God. 
and he doesn't even own it. Samuel calls him to the carpet and he doesn't even own it. He's like, again, oops, I sinned. It was not that big of a deal, you know, yada, yada. You see he's, he's being very flippant here. He does not care. And then he's more concerned with how people look at him and wanting to have people honor him that he's like, oh, Samuel, like, I know you're really mad at me and I know I kind of blew it, but stay here and honor me. So like, I look good in front of the people basically. And he's like, we will go up and worship your God. At this moment, we see his heart's completely turned away from Yahweh. He doesn't yeah. even call him my God, yeah. our God. It is now your God. So now we go to David, right? Second Samuel chapter 12, verses 1 through 24. This is after David has seen Bathsheba bathing, and he sleeps with her, gets her pregnant, kills Uriah, her husband, and tries to cover over the whole thing. It's not looking very good, right? This is supposed to be an, a man after God's own heart. And here he has lusted, he has coveted, he's committed adultery, and he's committed murder. Yeah. So he sends the prophet Nathan to him. And Nathan basically tells him a story where he's like, there is this rich guy. He's got all of this money, all these possessions, all of this cattle, all the sheep, everything you could ever want. He gets a traveler that comes to him. And they're big on hospitality at this time. It's an honor-shame culture. So if someone visits you, you prepare an elaborate meal. So this, this ruler does not want to sacrifice one of his plethora of sheep over here. So what he does is he looks at his poor neighbor that has one ewe lamb that he raised, that it was like his daughter. It says it ate out of his hand, it drank from his hands, and it slept with him at night like his daughter. This ruler goes and takes that lamb and slaughters it for the traveler that he didn't even care enough to prepare a nice meal for. David is indignant, and he says, this man deserves to die, and he needs to repay this fourfold. So the penalty for doing that, because they had to deal with this in, in Jewish customs, was you did repay it fourfold, right. but it wasn't a death penalty. Right. But Nathan bypasses David's brain almost, and he connects him directly to the heart of God yeah. over David's own sin issue. And so David, it says his nose burns with anger. He's so upset. He says this man should die. And Nathan's like, ta-da, you're the man. You're the man, David. And in this moment, David has a choice. By the laws at that time, if he says he's guilty, he deserves the death penalty. But he's king, so he can be like, no, I didn't do that. But in that moment, David says, I have sinned against the Lord. I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan says, God has put away your sin. You will surely not die, but you do have consequences to bear. Yeah. Okay? So he got Bathsheba pregnant. The child ends up dying. It releases a generational curse of lust that destroys David's family. And he is never the same. Yeah. And within one generation, the kingdom is divided and is conquered. Mm. Because he was the leader. And he fell. Yeah. But that doesn't stop God's plans for him. Yeah. It doesn't stop the way that God feels about him. God doesn't leave him while he has to bear these consequences. God's not like, oh, David, you blew it. I'm going to go spend time with somebody else that's more deserving. Somebody that has their stuff together. Yeah. Somebody that doesn't have your past. We see the God that stays. We see the God that will sit in the crooked consequences of your crooked choices. That's the definition of sin. There's three of them. Break trust, miss the mark, and sit in the crooked consequences of your crooked choices. And God does not leave. So how do we partner with God in light of all this? And it doesn't look super great when you just look at the people. But if we look at God, we see a God that never stops speaking. Yeah. There is a living word out there for you to partner with in every situation. Yeah. You know, Jesus is the word of God. Yeah. 
and it says the word is alive and active. That's right. Yeah. It's a person. He's alive and he's active and he never stops speaking. So when you think he's silent, go back to the last thing that he said to you. Yeah, yeah. Because that is your living word. That word will speak to your identity and it'll speak to your destiny and it will literally pull you out of whatever funk you are in and it will propel you into the plans of God. Yeah. So after looking at Moses and Gideon and Saul and David, I want you to know that you can't stop God when you mess up. Your failures don't stop God's plans and his love for your life. So find the word, find the word that he's spoken to you. And like I said, if you're in a, in a place of distress or pain, don't think that he's absent. Don't think that he has walked away. Don't think that you've blown it so bad that he can't be around you. That's a lie. Read any part of scripture and you will find that God hangs out with broken people. Yeah. yeah. Go in your might. What might is that? It's God, right? And then the last thing with repentance, you guys, is um, some people run away from the light. Jesus is light. And so it's easy to run away from a hard conversation. It's easy to run away from a rebuke. It's easy to run away from a bad situation. But everything is an invitation to intimacy if you will embrace the light that he brings. So if, if Jesus ever comes to you, Father ever comes to you, Holy Spirit convicts you, and you are coming up short, come closer. Thank you for letting me share with you. So Dana now is going to tell you about who we are partnering with. Let's get first one. Good work, man. Thank you. Oh, man. Thank you. Got to swap them out. <laughs> you guys watch me do this often. Mm -hmm. Start here, and about three words in, it's gone. <laughs> it's just the way it is. All right, so I need to get the little clicker here. There we go. All right. Good deal. That's good work. Thank you, Mary. Amen. Yeah, appreciate awesome. it. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> continue with partnership. We talk about partnership a lot around here. We do. I mean, it comes up often. You know, the, the one thing we're really good at alone is messing up. We can do that with style. Sure. You with me? But to but every every good thing in your life, seriously, is a result of input, relationship, partnership, connection, express something. You know, something happened, there was an exchange happening. You you are the culmination of everything that happened before today. Sitting here. You're, 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 you are the embodiment of every good interaction, every good conversation, every good prayer time, every good time in the Word of God. You hear me? You're that package. Isn't that great? And guess what? You boil it down, it comes down to partnership. Every good moment, every good interaction, everything you had, there was an exchange. That's what partnership is. Partnership is a healthy exchange. And so you're that result of that. Um, but I want to kind of, you know, we know that our God is to be uh, first in our life, and he's to be our partner through everything. But we, I want to kind of, I guess, clarify some stuff. Is Our God is three individuals. We understand that. That's what the Bible calls the Trinity. The three who are one. But you got to understand, they're all three unique, separate individuals. And the reason they're one is they're in absolute unity. They, they, they think the same, they act the same, they love the same. You know, you with me? Mm -hmm. 
but they're all individuals. And so we understand Father God uh, pretty well because, you know, we pray to Father God. We understand him pretty well. We understand Jesus because the Bible talks so much about Jesus, and we see him in the Gospels and see what he did, and we know what he did in our life because we trust him. Holy Spirit is the least understood of the Trinity. He is. He's the least understood. I mean, when I first trusted Christ years ago, we we're in a mainline denomination. And Father God, yes, Abba Father, dearest Father. Oh, Lord Jesus. And Holy Spirit was kind of like this power. You know, it wasn't a person, he was a power. The Holy Spirit is not a power, he's a person who is powerful. There you go. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. And nothing, I'm going to tell you, nothing was created on this earth without the power of the Holy Spirit. He hovered over the face of the waters. The thing is, Father, Jesus, and Holy Spirit got a plan together. They met and had a powwow. They said, hey, this is what this is going to look like. And Jesus said, I'll do it. But everything was created for him and through him. And the Holy Spirit said, hallelujah, Jesus, I'm going to partner with you. The Holy Spirit was Jesus' partner in creation, which was the heart of Father being expressed. So please keep that in mind. Just as Holy Spirit partnered with Jesus, and even on earth, him and Holy Spirit were like this, in partnership all the way to the grave, and then Holy Spirit said, come on, get up now, let's go home. But for us, please know this, Father is in heaven, he's on the throne. He's overseeing everything. Jesus is sitting next to Dad. He's talking about you and talking about me. <laughs> and he loves, and occasionally Jesus will visit with people but the thing is, he's primarily in heaven with Father, seated at the right hand of Father. The man on the ground and the partner that we do life with every day is Holy Spirit. Yes. Please know that. He's here. The Bible says he's the one who holds everything together until he's removed. With me? When, when there's going to come a day when Holy Spirit leaves and then things are really going to fall apart. But that's not until after Jesus comes back. All right? So... But he's the one who keeps your life glued together. He's the one who keeps your family glued together. He's the one who cares more about your marriage than you do. You with me? You don't make it 50 years doing a solo act, do you? No, you don't. And the reason you made it 50 years is because he was fighting for you more than you were fighting for your own marriage. All right, that's it. That's right. That's why me and Cheryl have been together as long as we have. Many of you have had long marriages. You know, it's because God cares so much, he never stops fighting for relationship and for partnership. And marriage is a beautiful picture of Christ in the church. Amen. Marriage is a picture of partnership. It is. And so let's talk about Holy Spirit, son, because he, if you trusted Christ, he came into you at that moment. And he partnered with your soul at that moment mm -hmm. to help you, little by little, become more like Jesus. That's right. That's right. It's, everything's partnership, guys. It's partnership. It's all partnership. So let's talk about Holy Spirit today because he is the partner. Right. Here we go. Some friendships don't last for long. But there is one individual, amazing, loving friend who is joined to your heart closer than any other. Holy Spirit. You hear me? Yeah. Please understand Jesus did not die for your ministry. He didn't die for your job. He didn't die for your hobby. He didn't die for that boat, that car, that house. He didn't die for none of that. He died for your soul. He's the love of our soul. And what it is, and he wants us to be so close. And the way we get to know Jesus, seriously, is through partnership with the Holy Spirit. That's it. We say he's joined to your heart. You know why? Because out of the heart proceed the issues of life. That's why he works there. He's in the core of your being, helping you and partnering with you and loving you. So let's keep going. Holy Spirit is our absolute closest best friend on the earth. He is. Amen. He just loves us, period, no matter what, like Mary was saying. Yeah. Guess what? On your bad day, he loves you. On your good day, he loves you. Yeah. On your weird day, when nothing makes sense, he still loves you. <laughs> yeah. You know, when you're being nasty, mm -hmm. he loves you. When you're being holy and sanctified, he loves you the same. Yeah. It doesn't change. It doesn't change. But see, he jealously loves. You know what I'm saying? Your God is a jealous God. And I'm going to tell you, you get Holy Spirit who is actually, he isn't just, a, he doesn't just act jealous or express jealousy. He is pure jealousy about you. You know what I'm saying? God doesn't halfway do anything. 
When it says God is jealous, that means he's tireless at, at, at pursuing his best in your life. He will not stop. He will not settle for second place. He won't do it. He's that good. So let's talk a little more about Holy Spirit, okay? So we're talking about him, but we need to understand him a little better, don't we? I mean, we may know a little bit about him. I, I mean, I, I still got a long way to go. I know all of us do. I don't care where you're at. If you're still breathing, you got a ways to go to know your God. And that's comforting to me. If I could figure him out, he wouldn't be much of a God. Amen. <laughs> I know you guys are very sharp and savvy, but I'm going to tell you what. You can, you'll never fully understand him. You with me? That comforts me. I don't want a small God. What about you? All right, so let's talk about this. And here's Jesus. He's about to depart and go back into, into heaven, into glory. All right? And he's going to talk about Holy Spirit. It says, he says, and I, this is Jesus, I will ask Father, and he will give you another Savior, yeah. this translation. And this is accurate. A lot of say another comforter, but bear with me. Don't get them walk out. <laughs> bear with me. Because you think another Savior, you're like, oh, no, there's only Jesus. You're right, but hang in, hang on. This is a good translation. It says, the Holy Spirit of truth, look at this, who will be to you a friend just like me. You see that? Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. And he will never leave you. I'm going to say that one more time. Somebody needs to hear that. He will never turn his back on you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He won't do it. Jesus was forsaken so you wouldn't be. You'll never be forsaken if you trust Christ. It says the world won't receive him because they can't see him or know him. But you know him intimately because he remains with you and will live inside you. Amen. So we're going to talk about this. Another Savior. And actually what it means, it says another, it means another of the same kind. Okay, Jesus was our Savior. He went home and Holy Spirit came and now Jesus is just doing the same things that, I mean, excuse me, Holy Spirit's doing the same things that Jesus did when he was here in person. Right. Only Holy Spirit can be everywhere, doing it with a lot of people where Jesus was in a small place at one time. So we're, seriously, we're better off that he went home. Sure. Not just that he's praying and interceding, but we're better off because Holy Spirit's here and he's with all of us at one yeah. time. Yeah. It's a global movement, not just a, a regional or local thing like Jesus was doing. Yeah. So praise God. So let's read the note. This is the Passion Translation. I like it. Um, but let's read the study note, and I want you to see this. All right, you see my little star, the Holy Spirit of Truth? Okay. So the Greek word here used here, I'll sit down so you guys can see better. The Greek word here used is parakletos. This is a technical word that could be translated defense attorney. It means one called to stand next to you as a helper. Various translations have rendered this counselor, comforter, advocate, encourager, intercessor, or helper. However, this is good. However, none of these words alone are adequate and fall short in explaining the full meaning. This translation has chosen the word Savior. For it depicts the role of the Holy Spirit to protect, defend, and save us from ourselves and our enemies and keep us whole and healed. He is the one who guides and defends, comforts and consoles. Keep in mind that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, our Savior. The Aramaic word is paraketo, which is taken from two root words, prop, to end, finish, or to save, and alita, which means the curse. Look at that. Okay. The Holy Spirit is busy saving you from all the damage that, that curse has done in your life. That's it. Hmm, that's good. What a beautiful word picture. Holy Spirit comes to end the work of the curse or sin in our lives and save us from its every effect. <coughs> Paraclata means a redeemer who ends the curse. Look at that. You know, you got you got the redeemer who ends the curse in you right now. <laughs> Isn't that good? Holy Spirit is the he, he is fighting for your soul right now. He's repairing the damage. He's restoring the years that have been eaten. You with me? He's restoring the years. Back in your crazy days, that damage you did. Yeah. He's restoring that. He's, he's giving you back more than was taken. Amen. So he don't barely, he don't barely restore. You know, I've said that you guys have heard me. He don't use band-aids. God does not have a box of band-aids. Mm -mm. No. 
No, he doesn't use band-aids. He, he covers nothing over. He goes to the root and heals it right there, and then the fruit changes. Yeah. Every time. And so let's be born. But isn't that good? Another saint. You know, that's really what Savior is. It's SOS. If you were shipwrecked and you were on an island yeah. and you were starving to death and you needed somebody to help you and you're out there, you know, gathering rocks, please see this. Please. Help. You're taking a stick. <laughs> you know, trying to get somebody to see you and rescue you. That's what Savior is. It means you are destitute, you're lost, and nobody can help you. Somebody had to come through and it was Jesus. And that's what the Holy Spirit's still doing. He's still rescuing us from, our, from the damage and from the things that hurt us. So let's keep going. Let's keep going. So who will be a friend just like me? I like it. Right here, verse 16. A friend just like me of the same kind. So with that in mind, since Holy Spirit is just like Jesus, think with me. This is interactive, all right? So I'm going to stir everybody up a little bit. All right? So, so wake up. Re-engage you. If, you were, if you get comfortable, let's pull, let's pull it back in. A few more minutes. You can go home and you relax. Hang on. But see, since Holy Spirit is just like Jesus, Think about Jesus for a moment. When Jesus walked on earth, now I'm going to ask you some questions. I want right. you to please share some answers with me. When Jesus walked on earth with his first disciples, how did he treat them? He loved them. Come on. He loved them. What else did he do? How did he treat his disciples? He went out, preferred them, kind. He went out. He trusted them. Yeah. He taught them. That's right. Yeah. Now, tell me what comes to mind when you think about Jesus and disciples. Is there anything when you've studied the Gospels or when you've read, just something kind of, made, if, if something jumped out with you, you know, to you through your studies about Jesus and his interactions, what would it be if you had a word for it? He was closer to them than with the crowd. He, he always closer. revealed more things to them. Yes, he yeah. did. What's that? Intimacy? Yeah. Yeah, somebody else. What's that? Touchable. He was yeah, he yeah. was always touchable, wasn't he? Jesus was always available. Okay. Personal. He was personal. That's good. Amen. So what did Jesus do? Think about some of the things he did when he was on earth with his side. What did he do? He taught. He taught. Healed. Healed. Provided. Provided. Rescued. What rescued? Yeah. Yes, rescued. That's good. Amen. What did Jesus say to him? He yeah. said, do what I do. Yes, do what I do. Follow me. Follow me. There's a lot of questions. I'm not looking for answers for everything, but just I want you, what I'm doing is I'm what I'm doing is I'm, I'm I'm causing us to see a personality here. You with me? A personality. Yeah. Because the personality we see here is the personality who lives inside of us now. All right. Here we go. So, and we've already touched on this, but give me a couple, just a couple interactions between Jesus and the disciples. What would that look like? Some, just a couple of interactions. Anybody? A couple of moments when he visited with them? He told them sometimes. Yeah. He, he, he did. He corrected them sometimes. Yes. He did. Well, they needed it. <laughs> Especially Peter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, com he comforted them. Yeah. That's good. Man, remember John? John, I mean, they're sitting around the table, and John's just sprawled out in his foot, you know, laying on it. Right. <laughs> we have a good God. Man, we have a good God. Mm. So, Jesus and his disciples had a lot of great conversations, didn't they? Yeah. Now, all of it is not in the book. Right. Someone say he never gave up on them. Yeah. That's good. That's you see that? He's tireless. Guess what? Jesus was jealous too, wasn't he? <laughs> just like Holy Spirit. But see, you've got to see the connection. And what I do is I'm just asking questions because we, we know a lot about Jesus, but guess what? If you know a lot about Jesus, you know a lot about Holy Spirit. Yeah. Okay. Okay, you see? So we're I, I bring a little more definition to he who is with us all the time. <laughs> Amen. So here we go. Here's just a little thing I, I put together, a little PowerPoint. Here's Jesus. He taught them how to pray. Yeah. He prayed for his disciples. He comforted them. He taught them the word, the truth. He corrected them when necessary. Yeah. Especially Peter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. He was a safe place for them to learn. Yeah. See that? Helped his disciples to rest. 
He healed, delivered, and set people free, his disciples and others. <laughs> I love it. Jesus enjoyed, believe it, he enjoyed visiting with and talking with disciples. Okay. Holy Spirit teaches us how to pray, prays for us, comforts us, teaches us the word, and leads us into all truth, convicts us of sin. He's patient with us. He leads us to rest. Because of Jesus, Holy Spirit heals, delivers, and sets free. Holy Spirit loves visiting with us and talking to us. Amen. You see, you know Jesus, you know Holy Spirit. That's right. You know, you do. But I, I, what my our goal today, me and, me and Mary's goal is, is to, to, to steer, basically not just to, to understand that we're in a relationship with God, that we enjoy Him and that we're, you know, Jesus has saved us and we're Father's child, but to understand that through partnership, through this connection, every good thing is, is actually accomplished through partnership. Every good thing. So, we're going to look at a picture of Holy Spirit's partnership in our life here. We've just got a couple more things. <clears throat> Romans 8, 28, 29, common scripture. So we're convinced that every detail in our lives is continually, daily, constantly woven together for good. For we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his design purpose. For he knew all about us before we were born, and he destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of his son. This means the son is the oldest among a vast family of brothers and sisters who will become just like him. And underlines the thing called purpose. All right, you see that? Things are continually woven together. Who's the weaver in your life? Holy Spirit. He's the one who's continually, constantly, ceaselessly weaving the good, the bad, the ugly, the nasty into a beautiful tapestry so you can look like Jesus. Yeah. That's yeah. what he's doing. That's what he's the weaver. And look at that. And, and, and this, all this weaving together is he's jealously making us look like Jesus. He is. And look at that. And you know, and, and I want you to see something here. We, there's, a, there's a now tense and a future tense in this, in this scripture. Yeah, that's good. The will become. Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit cannot take his eyes off of your destiny. Mm -hmm. Do you hear me? He never looks away from God's best for you. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Destiny is the fuel of Holy Spirit's jealousy. Do you hear me? Wow. He will not back off and take less than God's best in your life. That's why he does not leave you alone. Mm -hmm. He knows that if he backs off, you might just miss out on the nugget. You might just oh, miss that treasure. Okay. You might miss that moment that you were created to enjoy. He will not settle for less than God's best in your life. Mm -hmm. So when your heart's being convicted, okay. that's his jealousy saying, keep moving. Mm -hmm. Don't you stop. Invite me into that spot. Let's do it. So please, don't. Holy Spirit is so good. He's so good. He's over the top in love with Jesus. And guess what? He's over the top in love with you and me too. He will not stop. He will not stop. And I'm gonna share, I'm gonna share one thing and then we're gonna we're gonna be, be uh, about to close out. Um, to understand the Holy Spirit, you gotta spend time with him. You hear me? We pray to Father. We pray to Jesus. We do not pray to Holy Spirit. He's right here. You hear me? You understand? Yes. You don't pray, oh, dear Holy Spirit, I pray. No. no. He's like, oh, wait a minute, I'm, I'm like right here. <laughs> you talk to him. Because remember, another another Savior, another comforter like Jesus, did the disciples pray to Jesus when he was with them? No, they didn't pray to Jesus. No, no, no. They talked. <laughs> they, they, prayed to, they prayed to Father you with me they talked to Jesus now Holy Spirit is here we talk to him right. and Jesus is up there most of the time so we talk to him up there we pray pray to Father, pray to Jesus talk to Holy Spirit he's your very best friend, treat him as such share your day with him seriously, well I'm thinking about doing this day Holy Spirit hey, let's do this together let's have some fun today what do you think, ask him what he thinks often what do you think about Ask questions. Seriously, you'll be surprised. You might actually hear more. You ask more, you hear more. Yes, yes. That's, good. That's, That's good. good. Yeah. That's good. You know, you have not because you ask not. Start asking more. See what happens. Yeah. I love it. So, but uh, just a little thing about his nature. Probably three or four years ago, I was I was actually visiting with the Holy Spirit, and I was just I was having the best time. 
And I was like, Holy Spirit, what do you like? I don't care that I've been talking with him a long time. I want more, don't you? Amen. He's the God of more. Why should I settle for less? I know that's right. You know? But the thing is, I was like, what do you like? In the instant, he gave me a vision. I saw this little, little child. He was actually a little boy. And he was just looking up at me. Like, and and I, when I looked, I knew. Childlike faith. Mm. And, I, and, I, and I saw love hopes the best. Love mm. believes the best. Love expects the best. Love will never stop loving. Mm. And Holy Spirit said, I'm like that. I love you, and I will never stop loving you and wow. expecting the best for you. Wow. Then... And in the next instant, I saw a massive volcano erupting. And the power was amazing. It was lava going everywhere. I was like, whoa. He said, I'm also like that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Aren't you glad that the one yeah. has more power than the volcano yeah. also unconditionally loves us, <laughs> expects the best, and believes the best? Yeah. But just so you know, he, he, his, he's for you. He's for you. Yeah. He's for you today. And all that unlimited power of God is for you today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because he uses the power that he is to help us and take us into God's best. So one last thing is partnership is a choice, church. Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit's in you and he's helping you. But there's only so much he can do if we don't, we don't partner up with him and agree with him. Yeah. Are you with me? I will tell you, Holy Spirit, we take him for a ride down the wrong road too often. Because he's not going to leave us, he's not going to forsake us, but we sure put him through a lot. Yeah. <laughs> True. You know? But please choose. And you, you, most of you have heard this before. As soon as you're thinking about a decision, invite him into that spot. As soon as things you know, run off the rails, before you start taking matters into your own hands, get him involved. Are you serious? If you have an emotional surge, well, I've had enough of this stuff. Well, maybe he hasn't. You know? If you still have an emotional spikes, you ain't in enough partnership yet. Oh, thank you, God. Guys, and, and I'm just going to tell you, partnership with God has been the, 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 the strength of my life. I cannot say anything beyond that. Daily partnership, good, bad, whatever. Partnership with my kids, partnership in my parenting. Engaging my heart and connect with him before I engage my mouth. Guys, partnership, partnership, partnership. All right, so I know we're hitting that, but please, no matter what's going on, just, just get him there quick. Get him involved quickly and talk through it with him and keep moving. And guess what? You will surely get the good out of it. That's the only way to get the good out is through partnership with the Holy Spirit. That's it. So we're going to do a song right now that um, that I want us to put. So Cheryl's going to put it. Oh, yeah. There you go. Sorry. And one more verse. Here. And see, this is the choice. Move your heart, or you move your heart, closer and closer to God, and he will come even closer to you. We reach out. He responds. We partner. He, he embraces Thank you. We're going to do a song, and then we're going to close out. We will have a, a, a brief invitation at the end. Okay, so if you'd like to remain seated, or stand, whichever you prefer.